Today, we are going to talk about how to achieve healthy and productive hybrid work environments. 74% of U.S. companies are using or plan to implement a permanent hybrid work model in 2023. But what are the unintended consequences of hybrid? Will workforces become distant, less connected, and as a result, less engaged? What's the impact on employee mental health and well-being? And how will companies maintain strong cultures and productivity in hybrid environments? Today, we're going to answer those hard-hitting questions and more. My guest is Amy Freshman, Senior Director of Global HR at ADP. After spending 17 years in the sales organization in various roles, in 2012, she joined ADP's HR organization to lead its Flexible Work Arrangements Program. Since that time, her duties have expanded to becoming the human resources lead on all activities related to mergers and acquisitions within the company in partnership with their strategy organization. Amy leads critical programs and events, including an HR summit focused on learning and connection for ADP's global HR team members, and an annual company-wide month of wellness that provides sessions and engagement activities all about well-being. In February 2021, she achieved her SHRM SCP certification. Amy, welcome to Voices of HR. Hi, Berta. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited for today. We are super excited about this topic because there's so many companies that are moving to hybrid. And it really feels like there's a bit of a push and a pull strategy with employers wanting to maintain their culture and productivity, particularly in this high inflationary time period. And then you have almost 50% of employees who work one day a week at home and said they would quit if their employer mandated a full-time return to work. So companies are, I think are saying, we hear you and we think hybrid is the answer. So now taxed HR departments are now trying to determine, you know, what's the best policy moving forward and how will they align this workforce to the mission and the goals of the organization while becoming completely decentralized. So You've been doing this for a long time. You've actually been um, in a remote environment for quite a while here, um, 100% of the time. So I think it made sense that ADP tapped you to lead um, this post-pandemic work environment, what it's going to look like. So we have all these listeners on the other end of the podcast saying, you know, we've been asked to figure this all out too. So if we can, let's start at the beginning. When ADP tapped you on the shoulder... And said, we'd like you to lead this post-pandemic hybrid environment. How did you approach this strategically? And what questions did you have to answer or were you asked? Um, Can you take us through that step-by-step process? Yeah, sure. Uh, Thanks again, Berta, for having me today. Um, May not be a surprise to you and maybe to some of our listeners, but I was actually put in this role back in 2012. So long before we knew of a thing called COVID or the pandemic for that matter, and probably very similar to many organizations, we've had remote workers for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's been around since, I'll say for decades, um, predates me, but in 2007, we woke up as an organization and we had 1500 people in the U- just the US, right? Global company, but just the US mm-hmm. working from home most of the time, right? Wow. So it wasn't long before some HR leaders sat around and said, we ought to have a program <laughs> around this. We have no policy. We have no technology. We have no guidelines in place, right? Mm-hmm. It was sort of that natural. I work for you, Berta. And I say, hey, my spouse was relocated to any town in the world. We don't have an ADP office, but I'd really like to keep working for you can I go, right? And the good news was we had technology to support and say, yeah, go take your laptop and go. So I'll fast forward the tape. By the time I got into the role, there was a lot of it that was really already sort of set. Mm. What we did as a team is really look at the technologies, expense reimbursement as a specific. Mm. Um, We really wanted to do our best as an organization to ensure that those that were working from home most of the time 
had a similar experience to those working in the office. So think about technologies. I always look at my desk, which nobody can see but me, <laughs> but I've got dual monitors and a keyboard and right? it's like all those basics right. versus my example of I took my laptop and, and I went home. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the shift post pandemic to your to your question was recognizing we had more people now working remote that had never worked remote before. Right. A lot of them struggled with it, didn't really know how to manage it, right? So mm -hmm. we all didn't about face and moved home. And then over time, we realized we're going to be here a while. So a lot of the focus for us, as I mentioned, was how do we continue to make sure folks feel included, they feel heard, we can still see each other, right, with the onset of, of video conferencing and things of that nature. Um, and also making sure, and I like how you said this in the beginning, is we're still aligned to our company values. We haven't mm -hmm. lost as much as what <laughs> we probably thought we might throughout the pandemic. How do we sort of drum those things back up? Each person counts and, and making sure that we create opportunities for associates to till, still collaborate and service our clients at the same time. Yeah, because I would suspect, you know, if I was sitting in that C-suite role, senior executive role, I think we're all taught, right, to think critically and to think about what's what's the downside risk of all of this. So how did you approach some of those risks um, in this kind of post-pandemic hybrid environment? Or or maybe your senior executive said, no, we're we're kind of good with this, like we've already been through this a little bit. But most companies today, I think, are dealing with the typical assumptions that it will degradate their culture and their brand. It'll decrease productivity. There'll be loss of synergies gained by sitting next to each other and listening to each other's conversations. So did you have to assess the risk? And even if you didn't, how would you approach that for our listeners who do have those senior executives who are questioning whether this can actually work or not? Yeah, it's uh, it's a good question. I think one, I think many companies are still grappling with of mm -hmm. post pandemic, what do we look like? How do we operate? We prove that remote work can work, right? Everybody was forced to do it. We didn't have much of a choice. Um, and, and so we made it work under very tough conditions, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. So now fast forward, when the world sort of started opening back up, there was a feeling of, well, let's just put that genie back in the bottle and we'll be fine and everybody will come back. And it didn't take long for employees to say, hold on, I've created this environment for myself. And oh, by the way, I really need that flexibility for whatever, you know, fill in the blank mm -hmm. for whatever the reasons are. I, I feel like many organizations for this calendar year specifically, we're sort of at the tail end of figuring out how to balance both companies. What I'm hearing and what I'm reading is companies are really looking to their employees to hear from them. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of I'm C-suite or even I'm middle managers. I'm listening to my team, right? What are your needs? What's happening? But also recognizing where were we pre-pandemic from an, a, a company perspective, organizational goals, how do we operate? I also think that, that there's a, a bit of a misnomer that culture only happens in an office and culture means we have foosball tables or we offer free lunch mm -hmm. on Fridays, right? It, it, they're, they're all pieces of the culture, but my work location doesn't dictate what culture is or isn't. It's a matter of how do we think differently when we think about our culture, we think about our brand, how we operate, how we make decisions, how we get projects done. Now thinking about it of how do we optimize that in a hybrid environment? Three of us may be together two days a week, and then the rest of the time we're all dispersed from each other. The beautiful thing is we all have tools and technologies that can help us continue to collaborate and, oh, by the way, provide opportunity for us to work asynchronously when and where it makes sense. And I, I don't want to sidebar the conversation. Post-pandemic, it's made us rethink what is the purpose of an office. Why are we bringing people in? How often is the right amount of, to bring people in, the right frequency? It's going to vary by company and certainly by project or by business unit or by leadership. Um, but it's, I think it's a good, healthy dialogue to have is why are we bringing people in? Yeah, I think that's such an excellent point about culture. Uh, culture is people, right? And if the people can be flexible and the people are happier at home, 
and more productive at home um, and still can connect when they need to, that is still building the culture. I think that's such an excellent point. So as you thought about the strategic question with yours, it sounds like it it was fairly easy to get people to, your executives, to think about a hybrid environment. But what about those individuals who have executives um, who are saying, yeah, I'm still not convinced. One of the questions that I always ask in these kind of strategic questions is, what happens if you don't do it? What happens if you force everyone to come back into the office and disrupt their lives again? And what's going to happen then? Um, do you have any thoughts on that at all? Let's let's say they came to you and they said, oh, actually, we just want to bring everybody back into the office. It is kind of like stuffing a genie back in the bottle. What do you think the risks to an organization are if they moved in that direction? So it's a little bit of a Captain Obvious of bringing people back five days a week. I, I very rarely use words like always and never mm -hmm. is likely never going to happen on yeah. a broad scale, right? So forget yeah. about, I mean, all of you, like I was about to say a, a doctor in an emergency room kind of needs to be in, in the emergency room, but I know we've got telehealth, right? So, you know, it, it, it changed a little bit. Um, I, I think that it's a meet in the middle of where do associates, where do, where do associates want to be? Where does it make sense for them to be? But still meeting the needs, the objectives, the KPIs, the scorecard, right? Whatever your, your company goals are right. and ultimately servicing clients. Um, what will happen if you try to force too far in the other direction is some of what we've been hearing about, right? So the great resignation, the great reshuffle, quiet quitting, right? I could go on and on of all these, you know, fun little, little buzzwords that are real. Um, you have disengagement, you have challenges with productivity, retention, turnover, right? The stats on turnover have mm -hmm. been longstanding. Uh, you don't want to lose people. Uh, it don't. takes too much, too long, too much money to to find someone new and then get them up to speed to where that person was before they left. So the challenges are real for organizations. I, I think that while we're not going to, most companies are not going to go by the way of what do my employees say and I'm just going to do that. It's got to be somewhat meet in the middle. And that's really where conversations come into play. Focus groups, call it, you know, pulse surveys, what, whatever you might be doing within your organization to keep in touch with your associates and see how they're feeling. So you're advocating for, obviously, don't stuff the genie back in the bottle, but also meet your employees in the middle. It's not exactly everything that they want because, you know, I'm sure some of our HR pros are sitting there listening, thinking to themselves, okay, we had that employee who sold their vehicle during the pandemic because they didn't think they'd ever have to return to work. And now we're going to require you to come into the office, let's say two days a week. So how do you help those HR pros kind of think through those maybe acute, but very powerful pushbacks from employees who kind of took this opportunity during the pandemic to really fundamentally change their lives, yeah. not thinking that they were ever going to have to come back into the office. Yeah. Those are real examples, Berta. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you're <laughs> calling it out and it probably resonates with a lot of our HR listeners uh, on uh, listening in today. That's where those individual circumstances and those individual conversations come into play. Mm -hmm. um, Another one that I've heard uh, happen quite a bit is people picked up and moved, right? So maybe I reported to an sure. office a year in. I said, I'm going to go move near family and create a pod and right, do all whatever the, the reasoning might be. Now I'm so far removed from that office. Now you're asking me to come back in on some frequency. I, I physically can't. So right. organizations, really HR um, leaders, should be engaging on some of those. Those are those are nuances. Those are specific mm -hmm. examples. On the overall, we have opportunity to again. And by the way, you said meet in the middle. I might even just say meet somewhere in between. It might lean in our yeah. direction as a company. It might lean more in the employee's direction. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's where those individual conversations come into play. The other comment I would make is, it's been a progression, right? So maybe it started with the office is open. Come in whenever you'd like. 
Mm-hmm. And then a few months later, it became, we'd like everybody to try to come in on Wednesdays. I'm making it up, right? Mm-hmm. Wednesdays, let's come in, let's collaborate if you feel comfortable, right? We were still mass. We went through many stages um, and slowly made that pr- progression. But I'll go back to what I said a bit ago. When we talked about bringing folks in, we had to ask ourselves the question, why are we bringing you in? Are we bringing mm-hmm. you in because that's how we did business before? Because that's not a good enough answer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just worked successfully from home for two and a half years. And now you're telling me I have to come in because I can't do my job. Otherwise, we've we've blown that out of the water. So it made us really rethink and be more strategic and purposeful in right. why we were bringing people back in. So those are a couple of uh, comments I'd make on that. Yeah, I think you made an interesting point about just strategy in general. So we we try to talk a lot about strategy um, on this podcast because HR really has been forced in the center seat when it comes to people strategy, which is where they've been all along. It's just nobody was really kind of paying attention because business strategy typically gets all the limelight, right? And when it comes to people strategy, it's the same thing as business strategy. As the environment changes, you have to adapt. And if you don't adapt, there are consequences to that from a business perspective. I mean, our people are a greatest, a company's greatest asset. And so you have to treat them as such. So talking about our employees during the pandemic, you know, the pandemic really shed light on the importance of mental health in the workplace. And the approach that your organization took to employee wellness was really a holistic one, going beyond physical health benefits and really checking in with people where they're mentally and spiritually at. Why should, or what was the benefit of your organization kind of crossing that chasm and starting to have conversations about holistic wellness? Yeah. So, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, excuse me, thank you, Berta, for even asking the question and having this conversation. It's it's one of those, when we talk about overall wellness, mental well-being specifically, Mm -hmm. it's likely one we should have been having for a very long time, if we're being honest. True. Uh, Certainly the pandemic just exasperated the whole whole conversation. Mm -hmm. So when we think about wellness, we know that there is stigma associated, right? So that's something we learned early on. So my willingness to call my leader or call a colleague and say, I'm really struggling. Mm -hmm. Most employees likely wouldn't do that, at least proactive, unless they had a special relationship or, or some other door opener. The way you reduce stigma is you talk about it more often. So it's slowly becoming normalized. We're not there yet, but it's slowly becoming normalized. And so to right. answer your question of when we think about, you know, how we've looked at overall well-being, it's really our effort as an organization to open the conversation mm-hmm. and recognize that, yes, I am a payroll specialist or yes, I am a, I don't know, billing analyst, whatever my job mm-hmm. is but I am me. I am Amy Freshman. I come with my own hats that I wear on a given day. I'm a mom. I'm a sister. I'm a daughter, right? I could go on and on. And I think as organizations recognize that we spend a lot of time, what is it, 2,000 hours per year at work, who we are as a person comes with those hours at work. And I'm Mm -hmm. carrying a lot of I hate to use the word baggage, but I'm carrying a lot of things in my day to day. So as organizations really think about what is our role in wellness, I think organizations play a really big role. We have an opportunity Mm -hmm. in companies to ensure that folks know they're heard, number one. They have resources available to them. So that's a lot of what we did within my organization. And in, not just knowing that the resources are there, but really encouraging them to actually take advantage of them. A lot of them, and again, varies by company, are included in regular benefits. People just weren't mm-hmm. going out and using them, hence my conversation earlier around stigma. Um, they didn't want to be the one to use the employee assistance program, right? Because there's right. stigma associated. So I do think it's critical. And to your point around HR, 
it's our job as HR practitioners, no matter where you live, um, meaning live within the HR world, mm -hmm. to ensure that folks know. And we're doing a better job of serving up those resources to our associates and to our leaders. So you, so ADP, under your leadership, I think it was back in May of 2021, when the pandemic was really forcing everybody home, right, which led to for some, feelings of loneliness, exhaustion, isolation, that's when you and some of your colleagues in HR rolled out, I think what you termed the month of wellness at ADP. Will you share with our listeners how the idea came about and what is your month of wellness and how well was it received? Yeah, it's a great question, Berta, and one that I'm proud. I'm proud for many reasons to work for, mm -hmm. for ADP, um, but certainly proud of my HR organization. So that month of wellness started with a conversation between our CHRO and our CEO at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, and this was sort of, you know, trans, transcended down to me. Um, I did have a conversation with our CHRO at, at the time, but it was a recognition. It was more of a sidebar conversation, like back of the napkin <laughs> type conversation to say, we're hearing that our associates are struggling, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we weren't quite a year into the pandemic, right? So everybody had moved home and everybody was trying to figure out how long we're we going to be home for. So it was probably, um, I'll say, winter-ish time, uh, 2020, 2021. Mm. Um, so I'll fast forward. Uh, an eight, one of the HR leaders, senior HR leaders at that time called me and another colleague and said, listen, we had this sidebar back of the napkin conversation. We think we need to put forth an effort and let our associates know. And I'll, the big reveal, which is not so much of a reveal, is we created the hashtag, hashtag ADP, it's okay. And the genesis of that was, it's okay, and you fill in the blank afterwards. It's okay that you're not okay is really kind of the mm -hmm. headline. So I'm, uh, again, thrilled and uh, so appreciate our senior leadership recognizing that we were challenged and we needed to make sure that our associates knew that we were there for them and we were there to support them. So what our month of wellness, which actually we're now planning for our third annual, so this is now a, an annual event at ADP, and, and I'm going to cautiously say the word event now that I hear myself say it, because part of our intent from the very beginning, so the first one was 2021, was to not make it an event, but to raise the conversation open the dialogue, make sure we're doing a really good job at preparing and providing resources. We had an external guest speaker come in who was phenomenal, uh, a story of someone who uh, really had a hard time and mm -hmm. dealt with his own mental health issues. And anyway, he, he's now an advocate for, for wellness. Um, but that it began to thread through our every day, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's a matter of we don't just care about your wellness in the month of May, it, it really happens throughout the given year. So I'm thrilled to say, I'll fast forward the tape a little bit. Um, every which way I turn, whether it's a business resource group focused event, speaker or something like that, um, we have different business units and functions certainly within our organization. And I often get tapped to help come be a part of it. Wellness is such a popular topic within mm -hmm. so many parts of our organization. I know leaders are having having conversations um, and more and more in partnership with our benefits organization, we're continuing to think of different ways how we can be there for our associates. Mm -hmm. So our focus and the purpose of the month of wellness is to say, hey, we care about you. You're important to us. Your wellness is important to us. And we want to create opportunities to the best of our ability to ensure that you are able to carve out time for your own wellness. Mm -hmm. It could be a two minute stretch break. It could be a, you know what, Berta, it's just you and I talking on a call. Let's go take this for a walk. Let's go get some fresh air, mm -hmm. step outside. It's little, little nuggets of opportunities as opposed to we need to take 14 days to take you out of your, your seat. That's not, that's probably not reasonable. But companies really today, above and beyond just us, are really thinking about how do we thread it through our organization on a day-to-day. Mm -hmm. -day. I think you just took an, an, a, a possible issue that could have transcended the organization 
and really taken things off track and addressed it head on. I mean, that's what leadership's all about, right? Yeah. So I was having a conversation the other day with a friend of mine who's an employment attorney. And I know we have a lot of HR folks listening. And of course, one of the things that comes to mind for them is, okay, this whole conversation around mental health and um, how do we help our employees stay healthy when it comes to mental health? As a manager, you don't want to infringe on privacy, but you also want to help the employee. So how did you go about either training or having a conversation with your leaders so that they were fully prepared for A, the conversation and B, the month of wellness? Yeah. So it's such a great question. And one that we we learned early on. Um, One of the pieces of our very first uh, segment was a focus on leaders. So leaders Mm. are interesting, right? Because I'm my own person. I am an associate, right? But I wear a different hat because I've got a a team of folks, as I alluded to earlier. So we care about their own wellness, for sure, right? As that associate hat. But they are likely the ones, outside of HR perhaps, that are going to hear about or maybe see something first. So one of the things we did was we created, actually, we didn't create, we partnered with our um third party uh health provider and apparently they already had a uh, i think they called it mental health awareness training think about first aid right just like first okay. aid cpr but this is for for mental health a lot of it is really around raising awareness berta and being able to say okay so every week berta and i have a call and The last two times we've talked, Berta's not been on video or she's on video, but she's wearing a hoodie, which she never wears a hoodie Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, or, you know, just something feels a little bit off. She just, you just don't look quite yourself to me. Right. It's, it's recognizing small, subtle signs for me to pause and say, Hey, Berta, are you okay? Mm. And just stop, right? Wait for, for, in my example, Berta, you to, to respond. The, the second piece of that, though, is was being very clear. And again, in partnership with legal, and we've got an associate relations team, which some organizations may or may not have. Our intent wasn't to make managers mental health counselors. They're right. not there to solve all the issues. No. Um, and and nor would we ever want them to think that they're putting themselves in that position. Right. So for us, it was more about how do we ensure that the managers are armed with the right resources to be able to call and reach out to or recommend if nothing else, right? So I may turn to you in that example, Berta, and say, hey, I'm not sure if you're aware, if you're ever feeling like a bit off, you get eight free counseling sessions <laughs> through our EAP program, like mm-hmm. did, did you know kind of a thing. So it, it's it's preparing leaders to have those conversations, but not putting them in a position where they're giving medical advice or, you know, uh, uh, you know, breaking any of those privacy privacy issues, if that makes sense. But it's it's a very important comment and, and question as organizations think about this whole space of mental health. I think that's perfect. So so let's recap. Number one, identify, help to identify if there is an issue. And that typically is change in behavior, change in look and feel, maybe change in engagement. And then number two, kind of the did you know. That's right. That's right. Did you know, but also let me send you the links. Cause I don't know about other organizations. We have a ton of resources and some might say it's, it, there's too many. <laughs> I don't know yeah. how to navigate it. So how can <laughs> leaders help their associates really navigate it? That's also what our HR teams are for, mm-hmm. right? So there's lots of people you can call and say, hey, here's specifically what I'm looking for. Can you just send me the link of, of where that goes to? And I've been, able, I've been one of those people that folks have reached out to to say, this is what I need. Can you help me? Either I give them the link or I find someone who knows the link so I can, I, I mentioned it earlier, it's, it's a better job of serving up the resources to the associates. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it could be just overwhelming. And I suspect if an individual is having a difficult time and they are feeling um, overwhelming feelings of loneliness, um, that after they do leverage some of your resources, that HR does get involved then behind the scenes so that the manager, to your point, isn't the, the, the point of contact for the individual. Correct. Yeah, Berta, it's a, it's a good question. I think that leaders in partnership with HR are really there collectively to help address the associates. 
we don't want to leave the managers to be the sole, you know, answer, you know, solutioner, that sort of thing. That that's not uh, it's not realistic, uh, nor are leaders even equipped to be able to do that. We're fortunate in our organization; we've got lots of different functions that can jump in and help, mm-hmm. um, and certainly in dire type situations, right? We've got the right people to be able to call, um, but certainly the HR team is really there to help support not just the the leaders, but certainly the the associates themselves in certain situations. Absolutely. So there, I suspect your organization, I mean, because it sounds like such a concentrated effort and there was training and, you know, the, the goal was there to help everyone um, in a hybrid environment. Did you notice any changes um, in your organization after the month of wellness became an annual event? Or as you said, kind of threaded within the culture of the organization. Yeah, I, I, you know, I shared a bit ago around, you know, seeing and hearing of more wellness related conversations happening, events, guest speakers, uh, our enterprise learning organization specifically um, asked me to partner with them specifically on a a segment focused on wellness. So that's just Mm. one of many, many examples. Um, I, I think the other part of the conversation is uh, externally within our client base, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. So I've been involved in a couple of different programs um, where we're offering some of those conversations to clients. So it might be a larger event, but I can say, and again, I don't like to use the word always, very often there is a wellness segment that's embedded in That's new, Berta, right? New really Mm -hmm. within the last few years of recognizing that we're not the only company that's trying to manage through and care for their their associates. Um, Our clients are doing the same thing. So what can we do as a company help provide resources, insights, and and those sort of things to our clients as well? So you, at one point, let me go back just for a second, because during a conversation, I I suspect most leaders out there and most HR professionals encourage their leaders within their organizations to hold either weekly or, you know, twice a month conversations, one-on-ones with their team members. How often should a leader and should HR encourage a leader to have a healthy workplace conversation with their team member? Should it be every time, every other time? What is there a pulse? Um, How often? So I would first say that if it's really thread through an organization and more part of the culture and sort of the natural cadence, Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's as digital as today is, you know, whatever. I'm going to have the conversation with Berta versus natural course of conversation. I, I do feel like one of the benefits of having gone through the last three years together is more naturally i see it in calls that you could spend the first 10 minutes not even talking about the content of the call whatever the Mm -hmm. call is right whether it's a one-on-one or it's a group meeting or something i just had one this morning we spend a solid 10 we get a lot to go through and there's a lot of work to be done but as a world we are better about taking a moment to connect to really have a conversation to check in with each other, right? So that's been a you know a hot sort of phrase for a long time. Check-ins um, are critical to building relationships, making connections, but really getting to know each other. So I, I share all that, Berta, because I I don't think there's a, there's a digital answer to the question. Mm-hmm. The answer is it depends upon the conversation. Also depends upon what we talked about last time. So if last Friday you told me you're going to run a race, I'm probably going to ask you about what that rate, you know, how did you do? How did you feel? It, it should be thread through the conversations and the connections and less about making sure I include it because it's something that I should do as a leader. Does that make Got sense? It. it does. And I love your your thought around weaving it into the culture because I had a leader at one point in my career. He started every one-on-one with, how's everything going? How are you doing? It was always this very open-ended question. And I guess what whatever was important to me was what I brought up first and then second and then third. And so I suspect by by just using those open-ended questions, you're going to really be able to focus on whether they are having any 
mental issues or, um, or if it's just work related. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, I also think, um, and this has always been the case too, is how much personal versus how much, how much mm-hmm. business related topic, right? So as a leader, I don't want to press too far. I certainly don't want to ask anything that's going to make you feel uncomfortable, right? but I want to ask questions that help you to recognize that I care about you as a person. I'm mm-hmm. interested in you or your family or, you know, whatever the, the, your in, inner circle will be. Um, but I do think that, you know, really good leaders that I've worked for have have figured out how to have those conversations, create those connections, but really becomes a relationship where you might call me that one day and I say, you know what, Berta, I am not good. I'm just right. not good. Here's what I'm dealing with. And I'm struggling. So I just wanted to make sure you knew. So if you see me off grid for the rest of the day, that's right. why. Right. So that that doesn't happen overnight. That happens through relationship and through time and connection. Absolutely. And I would suspect the frequency of those conversations is really going to either tee you off to, or tip you off, I should say, to a conversation with HR or with the individual that's maybe a little bit deeper. Yeah, for sure. So where do you think hybrid work is going for most companies? And what do you think, let's say three to five years from now, what do you think the benefits and the drawbacks are going to be? really particularly around the health of the organization and the individual. Yeah. So I, I think I alluded to it earlier. I, I feel like in tw- looking back and then looking at where we are today, I think by the end of this calendar year, my my prediction, my suspicion is most companies will probably settle in, of course, barring any unforeseen crazy circumstances, we'll, we'll kind of settle in. And when I say settle in, I feel like the three, two, two, three is probably where most will land. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, the, the conversations of other conversations you're hearing around, we're going to close all our offices and no one's ever coming in. There will still be some form of in-person collaboration. I I mentioned it um, when you and I chatted uh, before this conversation, I've been remote for since 2007. Right. Mm -hmm. Happened sort of naturally uh, through the course of different jobs. I was traveling anyway. um, uh, You know, it's not a new topic. It's not a new way of working. We've just gotten and will continue to get better at it. Mm -hmm. But I share that, that I've been a remote worker for a long time. But even through all those years, I had in-person collaboration. I had in-person meetings. Mm -hmm. I go to where I need to be and and usually it's one meeting that brings me there and then I wrap a bunch of other meetings around it because I'm there. And I sometimes I literally take the hour to just go walk the halls Mm -hmm. and just check in with people that I, by the way, haven't talked to in a long time or have never met face to face. There is nothing that will ever replace an in-person meeting. And I'm, I've been a remote work advocate for a long time and believer in, in how it works. Um, But the 2332, going back to your question, is probably where we will land. Mm-hmm. What companies need to continue to work through is what are my what are my company values? What are our goals as an organization? Mm-hmm. And how does hybrid work continue to fuel that as opposed to deter us from being able to do those things? We have the ability. I, I firmly believe we have the ability, regardless of the organization. I think where the company... F- sort of leans in that three, two, two, three, or some combination um, will, will play into those company values. We talk about culture a little bit earlier, brand, who we are as an organization. Do people want to come work for me? Am I a top employer? And where does work location, because that's really what we're talking about here, play into that? The other piece, which we didn't really spend time talking about is work location is is all, there's the hybrid work thing. Mm -hmm. But there is this broader conversation around flexibility. So flexibility might be my hours that I work on a regular basis, or maybe I just need to flex one day for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Not every job has the ability to flex, so we recognize that. But where that flex is possible, that will also play to your question of how is, how can we best attract and retain talent, right? So Mm -hmm. if I need some of that flexibility, and then from a company perspective, it could give me opportunity to 
maybe even better service my clients because I may have someone that works a flex schedule. I start mm-hmm. my shift at 6 a.m., but you don't start till 10 a.m., right? But we're able to, to really service clients. So I think there's a lot of room for companies to, again, think more broadly around flexibility, not just my work location. I think that's an excellent point. Are there any, I guess in marketing, they're called KPIs, um, you know, HR, we have our own list of measurements, engagement, it could be ENPS. Um, w- are there any measures that you acknowledge are good measures of whether hybrid is working or flexible work environments are working? It's such a good question. And it, it so brings me back when I first started in this role and we were just sort of recognizing or I guess realizing that we are a flexible company because we've got people who work in different locations. And by the way, we'll never be able to bring 58,000 people physically together. So guess what? We're always going to be remote from one another. But I had a leader call me <laughs> very early on and I sort of laugh a little bit. And he said, um, I have my first remote worker. Like I have got, normally everybody's sitting outside my office and here's the situation. And and the person went to go work remotely um, and I'm concerned. And I said, tell me why you're concerned. <laughs> he said, well, how do I know if they're working? And so I, I kindly responded <laughs> and said, how did you know that they were working when they were in the office? Mm-hmm. And it, it was like a big, you know, light bulb mm-hmm. went off for him and said, Gee, I never really, thought, never really thought about it that way. So luckily I had a good relationship with him so I could, I could be somewhat flip about it. But I said, the KPIs, the scorecard, however you're rating your associates, mm-hmm. right? From overall performance, productivity, et cetera, should be location agnostic. It mm-hmm. shouldn't matter where I am. It's more about what am I producing? What are my results? The location that I'm in doesn't mean it doesn't get looked at, right? Because I think to your earlier question, companies really do need to think about how hybrid work may or may not be impacting them in a positive or maybe negative basis. But it was through that conversation that it made me realize to say, to ask ourselves the question of, are the KPIs scorecard, like how we're measuring things? Mm -hmm. Does, does work location matter? Is it part of that scorecard? It could be a, a layer, right? A data layer point and, and a filter that gets applied after the fact. Mm-hmm. But I challenged him to say, you need to make sure that you can you can rate your associates productivity having nothing to do with their location. Mm-hmm. So um, hopefully that answers your question, but it always brings me back to that conversation. That was like in 2011 and I still remember it like it was yesterday. It is, it is. And Productivity, I mean, and happiness and engagement of employees, that can actually increase with a hybrid work environment. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a good question. It is, you know, there are data points out there, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't direct folks out to uh, ADPRI, ADP Research Institute, ADPRI.org. Yes, um, there's a ton of research out there, not just on this topic, but on all things workplace related, trends, et cetera. So, you know, I, I think that um, when we think about things like engagement, we should be looking at it at, from a lens of where is this person most of the time? We've done studies over the years um, and the engagement data, productivity, turnover, for the most part, I'm going back to 2015. Mm-hmm. So it was a long time ago. So that's why I direct people to come work. Current, yeah, well, pre-pandemic. Sure. There was really little to no difference, Berta, in any of those metrics. Engagement was actually a tick higher. So again, pre-pandemic, mm-hmm. for those that worked remotely, I don't have a commute. <laughs> I yes. don't have to wear a suit every day, right? Like, you know, a, um gas costs and, and you name it, right? So there were some inherent benefits. And oh, by the way, I'm never more than 20 steps from my desk, which mm-hmm. we talked about it already, right? That the back side, the, the negative side of being a remote worker is I'm always there. I'm always mm-hmm. able to just jump on the computer versus leaving my computer at the the office. So um, so hopefully that answers your, your question. I, I think that uh, when we think about some of those data points, we should be looking at it, but I don't know necessarily we're at a point anymore in today's world that it should be a driver. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So we just mentioned um, 
a resource for our listeners, which we will definitely put in our comments um, as well. That's great. Okay. So at the end of every podcast, we have rapid fire questions, one questions, um, one sentence questions with one sentence answers. You ready to play? I'm ready. All right. What do you wish everybody understood about your job? What I wish everyone understood about my job is it all relates to the employee experience. Mm. What is your favorite book and why? Uh, So work-related, I'm going back early stages of of career. Um, You don't have to have a title to be a leader. That was Mark Mm. Sanborn. Um, Life-related, I I refer to The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. When I say refer to it, in my head, Mm -hmm. I tie to it. So that's another recommend. Love Malcolm Gladwell. What move did you make that had the biggest positive impact on your career? I have to say moving from sales to HR gave me a much bigger appreciation for all of the amazing work that happens within HR. I had I really had no idea. (laughs) So that was big for me. And I've been able to stay with the same company for a long time and continue to grow my career. Do you have a favorite fail forward of yours? Um, I don't know that I have a favorite. I can tell you that there have been many. (laughs) Um, What I would tell you when I think about favorite or when you ask that question, I would say when you're within the moment, it feels enormous. And then, of course, as we all know, with hindsight, maybe it wasn't quite as big as it was, but it was still a lesson or still an opportunity to learn and grow. Um, missing sales plan is like one that you know certainly comes to mind. It was just a month, right? But it, so that, that's what I would say. It's, it's a number of small ones that felt really big at the time that, that were more opportunities to learn. Who's your mentor or industry role model and why? So I've had a lot of mentors throughout my life. Some have been formal and some have been kind of informal. They probably don't even know that they were mentors. Um, When you say the word role model, I I have to think about my dad. Uh, He... He's a life role model. He grew up in Hungary. He escaped during the revolution in 1956. Mm -hmm. Um, He learned a trade when he came to the States and he did that trade and opened up his business and cared for, you know, supported his family. Uh, Work ethic, perseverance, my dad. Sounds like a great one. Why should CEOs give HR the credibility they so deserve? So my first reaction is I'd like to think many already do, but maybe that's like the positive side of me. I'm sure there are some that are still thinking like, what is this HR thing and why do they need a seat at my table? (laughs) Um, So HR is both a key partner and an enabler. So you, you talked about it a little bit earlier and you said something that connects with me here of you know, business unit leaders, like they've got their own focus and HR is kind of over here. HR's role is to drive the business goals. It's to help build the brand and maintain the brand and make the organization an employer of choice. It's all of those things. So I think ensuring that CEOs recognize that the HR organization, as I mentioned, is I, I really love that word enabler, will enable that business to grow and flourish to, to whatever degree that they're they're set out to do. What is a tangible next step that listeners can take back to their business from our conversation today? Maybe they're considering hybrid environments or they're right in the thick of it and they need to come up with a solution to propose um, to their organ back to their senior executives. What do you think their next step is? So uh, data analytics is definitely uh, my first reaction to that, Berta. So I mentioned ADPRI. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Kate Lister from Global Workplace Analytics for a number of years also. She's done a ton of work. um, And there's probably more that I can share with you um, that you can put in show notes if you'd like. Sure. Using the data, the research, the insights, and that's really what it is. Data is great, but you got to get to the point where there are insights and then being able to look internally in your organization to say, where are we on this journey, right? I mean, it's a spectrum (laughs) and it's always fluid, right? This notion of I'm going to get there and then I'll just be able to stay there forever. That doesn't, that doesn't, that's not realistic either. So um, determine where you are on your journey. 
use the data insights, start to meet with leaders. I think a good recommendation is always to sort of spitball it or bounce it off of a few key leaders that you know you've got good relationships with, Mm -hmm. and then you can go more broadly. So when I say, where are you on this journey? It's some are further down the path of Mm -hmm. this wellness journey and really opening the dialogue and having conversations, and some haven't touched it because they've been afraid to or haven't had the resource, like fill in the blank. So at the end of the day, companies today really need to think about how do I best support my associates through this journey of wellness and well-being? Absolutely. Where can people go to learn more about you? So probably the best place is LinkedIn, um, which I uh, will share uh, the link, uh, but you can find me at Amy Freshman. I have opportunities to write some articles, so I post those there. Um, and I share information, data, insights, posts, either from colleagues within my my industry um, or directly from ADP Research Institute for sure, because there's a ton of work coming out of our space specifically. Um, but it all surrounds that employee experience. So if you're not following me today, uh, I welcome it. So thank you. Today, we have been joined by Amy Freshman, Senior Director, Global HR at ADP. Thanks again, Amy, for joining me. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Berta. I so appreciated the conversation. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks so much for watching. We would love it if you shared your thoughts on any of the topics we discussed in the comments below. And if you got value from the video, it would mean the world to us if you hit the like button and subscribe to the HR Morning channel. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Voices of HR.